now down to the official stuff. Oh, there's a first day handout too. I should pass these around. This is one of the few official requirements of the college is that you have to get on paper what the rules are. So, um, here's the rules to the class. The printer list, uh, this is not the NS security. Let's try the right class. Okay, good, all right. <laughs> this is network security monitoring. It's a new class based on this book. Um, and so the point of this is, this is now really important. Everybody is doing this these days. Um, and I'll be explaining more in detail in the lecture, but it is now, this happened because of the advanced persistent threats. In 2010, Google decided to spill the beans and expose that China was hacking them. And China had been hacking everybody for at least five to seven years at that time, but everybody had been keeping quiet about it. But what they did was they put persistent malware on your machines so they could keep stealing everything forever. And it was very hard to get off, and everybody decided they had to upgrade their networks to prevent that kind of attack. And that took years to figure out, and network security monitoring is a big part of it. So now, you have to have layers of defenses. You have firewalls and antivirus and all that jazz. And then you are aware that when somebody serious like Russia or China wants to hack you, they're going to blast right through all that like it wasn't there, and they're going to get in. Just like you have fire alarms everywhere, Whatever prevention you have will eventually fail, and then you have to have another layer of defense responding when an attacker gets in. And that's what network security monitoring is for. This is how you detect when all your security controls have failed and some bad thing is happening on your network, and hopefully you detect it fast enough to send an instant response team to stop the bad guys before they get too far. Why so, not what's that? Why not just unplug the motor? <laughs> that, of course, used to be an option. Um, and that's how we used to do it back in the early in the 80s and the 90s, unplug the modem. Um, but these days, your company, the problem is these guys are, are persistent and slow. So as the case we'll see, they were spending a month getting in and then staying in forever. So you can't turn off your internet connection for a month. Most modern businesses can't even turn it off for a few hours because their business requires internet flow. So I mean, that's, uh, that's the real answer. What you want is you need to continue providing service and clean out the bad guys. And for that, you need to be monitoring the network to tell good traffic from bad traffic. So anyway, here's the game. Um, we're going to walk out. We're going to use Security Onion is the open source tool. We're also going to use Closed Source Splunk, which is the most popular product. And um, we're also going to use Elk. Elk Stack is a common one kind of between the two, also free. In general, small businesses and highly technical places that like Linux use a Linux-based solution. Linux-based solutions are usually very buggy and very hard to use compared to commercial solutions which charge all that money and then they make it easy, it runs on Windows, it's got to use the mouse. When you have a problem, you wind to the vendor and they sell you an upgrade or something. Whereas in Linux, very frequently you're using something that has a bug and when you want help, the developer says, oh, I abandoned that project five years ago, get lost. And there's nothing you can do because it was free. So anyway, uh, we'll use each all these products. They all do approximately the same thing. Um, you somehow collect packets off the network, and these products will then tr make it easier for you to search through the packets and, f and logs and find out the bad events. So anyway, that's the goal. We'll learn how to configure these things and how to search through them to find uh, net evidence of intrusion. There are quizzes starting at the next class, which is 919. There's a quiz due before class. The quizzes are all online, multiple choice, open book. You get two attempts. They're at the City College online system, which is ccsf.instructure.com. <laughs> so you log in with your RAM ID that you can get from the City College website, and you can take those quizzes anytime. But they're due before the class on that topic, because I found out this is much more effective to teach the students to make the only purpose of the quiz is to encourage you to study the chapter before class. That way, you, you, the only way you learn is by going over material a few times. So study the chapter, take the quiz, then we'll have a lecture on it. And the end result, I found, is people know it better. Um, pretty much everybody gets everything right on the quizzes because it is open book and everything, so it's not that hard, but it just means you actually have to read the book. So, um, all right. So I'll cover the first chapter tonight, and next time there'll be two quizzes due, chapter one and chapter two and three. There's only about six total class meetings of this class. It's not every week. It's only one unit. And there's a final exam, but the final exam is optional because you can do extra credit projects. Um, the lecture notes are here. The lecture slides are here if you want them. Um, here's the project. Uh, the first thing you got to do is set up Security Onion, either on a Mac or a PC, just whatever you have. Uh, I wouldn't bother doing both of these, just do one or the other. Um, and then 
There's an extra credit setting up an Elk stack, which is a different open source Linux version. And I'm almost done writing the Splunk version. So we're going to have three network monitoring systems in the projects, all that do more or less the same thing. But you, it's worth knowing them all. This one is the older one that is considered really serious security onion. Uh, Elk is considered more like for small companies and home networks. It is simpler and easier to use, but it's also open source. And Splunk is the one all the big corporations use. It's very expensive. It's very nice. There is a huge community of people contributing and training and everything. It's one of the standards, like Windows Server. It's huge and important, like, like Exchange Server. Everybody uses it. It costs a lot of money, but it's worth it. And Splunk does have a free version. You can use it for free for small amounts of traffic, like up to, I think, 500 megabytes a day or something. So you can't really protect a large network without paying their large license fees, but you can use it and learn how to use it. And it's very nice, very luxurious. Basically, it's like Google for your network. <laughs> you can open a page, a search engine like Google, and you can search through all the packets and all the logs on all your devices to find bad things. And there's a whole community of people that have written queries. You find me the SQL injection. Find me the people that are scanning me with Nmap. Find the people that are installing malware, and it'll just find it. So it's very nice. Anyway, um, all right. So I've got a uh, grading system I'll say a word about. Not too exciting. Same as all my other classes, but there's this part of that handout you got. So there's a textbook. And uh, so there'll be some projects, a final exam, and some uh, Quizzes, which I forgot to put here. Sorry about that. The total will be bigger. I wrote this when I wasn't using quizzes in these one-unit classes, but now I am. So it'll probably be more like 300 points. Whatever it is, the total 90% is an A, 80% is a B, and so on. And there's a bunch of extra credit stuff. So people who take the quizzes and do all the projects and do extra credit projects frequently find that they don't need to take the final. They can get an A without taking the final, and that's fine with me. Although anyone's free to take the final if you want to. Um, you can also take this class, pass, no pass, but you probably don't want to do that because then you can't use the class for any city college degrees or certificates. But if you don't care about that, you might do that if you are, for example, a major in something like biology with a perfect 4.0 and you don't want to mess it up on one class on the side, although I don't think this would be the one you'd pick. But anyway, yeah. If you take it for pass, no pass, can you retake it? No. As far as I know, if you take it pass, no pass, and then you decide you want a certificate or degree, you're pretty much hosed. You're going to have to take some other course and substitute it in. It's credit. Yeah, with the same guy. Right. So that's why it's not recommended. Very, most students who take pass, no pass, so later on realize that really wasn't the best option. So you probably don't want to do it, but it is technically available if you want it. Just uh, be aware of its significant bad side effects. So you turn in projects. Um, there's a due date for them. If they're more than two weeks late, I might not take them. We'll see how it goes. This semester, I'll probably have to enforce the uh, on-time rules pretty strictly because my classes are so full. Um, anyway, I don't, um, so you lose five points if you're up to two weeks late, and after that, they're no good at all unless you can convince me that you're really in the hospital or something. Uh, if you're cheating and copying somebody else's work, I'll probably just throw you out of the class. Um, you're certain, observe what's happening here. I mean, my other classes, you learn how to attack networks and take them over. This is even worse. You're monitoring networks. You're seeing everything that happens on a network. You can totally spy on people. Uh, cops do this. People in hospitals do this. They spy on what celebrity is sick, and then they leak it to the National Enquirer. And, you can go to prison for that. I mean, if you're going to be a security professional, it's like being a cop. You have to have some internal sense. You have to have the sense not to do bad things you could do. So if you're so dumb, you cheat in class. You don't belong in this profession at all. Because once you learn how to be a security professional on the internet, you're like a cop with a gun. You have tools that can really hurt people. And they have to really trust you. So anyway, um, be aware of that. You should. If anybody's trying to truck, talk you into doing anything bad, talk to me. Let me find out what's happening. I don't get much of that, but usually it's more the beginning classes that have this cheating nonsense. But if somebody's doing something unethical, uh, let me know, and I'll try and cope with it. Anyway, if you use the online lab, or I mean the physical lab, in the Science 214, there's a hacking lab. The machines in there are uh, wide open. They're being used by all kinds of hacking classes, so don't use them for shopping. Don't type any passwords you love on those machines. Don't be surprised if you start something and come back next week and somebody's wiped it all out. You know, it's pretty much a free fire zone in there. Um, so anyway, you need to have the book and study it, and you need to have a computer so you can do the projects. If you don't have a computer you want to use, you can do the projects in Science 214. There are open lab hours every day, and there will be more in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, you can certainly do your work there. 
just be aware that nothing in there is really private or secure in any way. There's a flood of students, and each one of them could just reformat the drive or do anything. Um, and if anybody has any special needs, let me know. I'll attempt to cope with them. Uh, there's no points for attendance. You don't gain points just by attending, and you don't lose points by not attending. And you can attend online, either in real time or later, by watching the videos. Um, all that matters for your grade is the quizzes and the homework. And the homework comes in by email. So you could be a thousand miles away and succeeding in this course. You can even completely ignore the lectures if you don't like them and just read the book. It's all in the book, too. That's fine, too. But anyway, um, any questions about anything? I got ad codes. How many people need to add? Just a few. All right. Uh, there'll be a break pretty soon. And I'll, uh, when we take a break, maybe half hour, I'll do take care of the ad codes. All right. I've been adding people with complete disregard for the size of the room because I believe a lot of people won't keep coming after today. I mean, I don't expect everybody to not bother coming, but I think a significant number of people have a long commute or a bad work schedule and would otherwise probably rather do it online. So I don't think this room will continue to be so crowded. All right. So we might as well start the first chapter, which is here and here. All right which is pretty much uh, explaining what this whole point is. So uh, what is this nonsense anyway? I'm going to explain what network security monitoring is and then talk about its benefits, how it works, and its drawbacks. So you understand what you're getting into here. Um, the point of network security monitoring is that you are watching what goes on your network with these automated tools and with humans who are analyzing them to try to find out if somebody has hacked you. Uh, five years ago, we interviewed top C-level executives, 90% of them said, we've never been hacked, we never will get hacked, we're wasting my time with this security garbage, just, just take a hike. And when they started asking them that question about three years ago, 80% of them admit that they did get hacked last year and they lost money because of it. So now, just like um, employee theft and parking accidents and employees being sick, being hacked is just something that's going to happen. It's just the fact of life. So you can't just pretend it's not going to happen. You have to accept there's just going to be, occasionally we will get hacked. And we have to have some plan what to do when that happens, just like we have fire alarms and everything. So then you need an incident response team, which might start out as just one person at a small company, but it is much bigger at larger companies. And these are people who are trained to handle security incidents on the network, just like you have campus cops to handle physical security incidents. So uh, this is a continuing business process. And network security monitoring is a good first step to move from no incident response to incident response. This is how you find out people are on your network. So um, your, your incident response team is one person, and at large companies, it's more. And this is the person you call. Like when uh, students are having fistfights in the hall, you call the campus police. When there's something bad on the network, you call these guys. Do something about it. There's a virus on a network. <laughs> somebody's hacking things. So they have to collect network-derived data so they know what's going on, and then they have to analyze it to find out what damage has been done. Then they have to work with the owners of those assets and figure out how they can uh, repel the bad guys and protect the data without interrupting business any more than necessary. Because like someone said, pull the, plug, pull the plug on the modem. That would be the simple solution, but that would totally stop business too, so that's probably not acceptable. Instead, you have to find a way to keep business running while ejecting the bad guys. And then you have to do damage assessment. When you do kick out the bad guys, you have to decide what did they get, what do we have to do. If they actually manage to get important company secrets like customer credit card numbers, you probably have legal obligations to inform them, tell government agencies that are regulating you about it, issue press releases and all that jazz. Um, there's, you, you have to decide exactly what happened, and then there's a whole bunch of consequences. So there's a cycle here where your IT, uh, your security teams are collecting and analyzing data and then finding things and escalating it up. And up here, people are uh, designing uh, systems to determine it. So you have normal IT up here, where they just install systems that can hopefully monitor. And then you have security professionals here, which are not the same thing as normal IT people. They have a different set of skills. Anyway. Um, so to prevent intrusions, that would sure be nice. And that's what everyone tried to do until about five or six years ago, largely because of the Chinese hack of Google. That was the wake-up call for everybody that, you know, even Google can't keep these guys out. Even the NSA can't keep them out. Even the FBI can't keep them out. You know, it's probably about time for us to quit pretending 
that our pathetic firewall is going to save us. Uh, the fact is, if people, prevention is going to fail and people are going to get in, so we're going to have to have a plan what to do when they get in. And if you have good monitoring and instant response, then you can hopefully detect that they got in, but prevent them from achieving their mission. So they get in, but it's so difficult to move around your network that it takes them weeks to find the crown jewels and you have time to kick them out before they get them. That's the plan. When I first heard about this in 2010, I laughed at it. I said, you've got to be kidding. Nobody can do that. But we are really doing it these days at the larger companies, and now even medium-sized companies are doing it, and that creates a huge job market for security professionals that know how to do this. And that's why I took a class that used to be forensics, and I'm going to replace it with a class in incident response. I taught it the first time a year or so ago here. It'll come around again, because <coughs> this is the new hotness, monitoring and incident response. Five years ago, it was all prevention. But now we still have prevention. That still matters. That stops a lot of attacks. But you have to have another layer behind it of detection and incident response for when prevention fails. And that's why there's such a boom in the security market. Every company that never wanted to do this at all is finding out they have to hire more and more and more security staff. Because the cops can't save you, the NSA can't save you, and the internet is really dangerous. So even if what you really want to do is make shoes or cookies, you have to hire a, a computer security staff just to do that, which is pretty annoying. I had a friend that used to go to El Salvador all the time, and the cops are so corrupt down there, they do nothing. So every business has to pay their own guard to stand in front of the business with a shotgun. Oh, and that's the way the internet is. Everybody has to have their own security staff because you're getting hacked right and left, and it's so uncivilized, and there's, no, there's nothing remotely like cops making it safe. There's so... <laughs> Everybody has to have their own security team. At some point, that may turn around, but not any time soon. So there's a huge wave of employment for anybody that learns security. Yeah. yeah I'm Central America. I've been down there a few times. And yeah. it's, that's true in Guatemala. And they have, uh, the armed uh, security officers have absolutely no education. That's, out of the hills and, yeah, my, one, of my, uh, one of the guys in my extended family is, we used to be a captain of police. And he said he went down there and he said, man, these guys, they're hiring for security guards. I wouldn't let them in the police program in San Francisco because they need so many of them. They're hiring bozos to stand out in front with a shotgun and pretend to be the security guard. Which, by the way, means even if you aren't a very good student, you can get a job in security right now. Five years ago, my students couldn't walk into security jobs. You'd have to be a network administrator first. Now, even the mediocre students are walking right into jobs because everybody's desperate. They're hiring with both hands. There was a study that came out a couple weeks ago that said that for every security professional, there are two jobs now. They don't even have half as many as what they need to meet the demand. There's a chair over there, okay. even with a table and everything. Can go yeah, go around. Come around back here. It'll be all right. Sure. The customer is important. <laughs> all right. So anyway, uh, so you can't prevent intrusions. So, and this is because things keep changing. If you have a firewall or an antivirus, that stops the old attacks, and there's always a bunch of geniuses inventing a new attack that will blast through that stuff. So you can't possibly stop them all. This is like the TSA. I mean, they're always stopping the last bombing. They search your shoes because somebody put a bomb in their shoes. They're always stopping the last attack. That's just the way it is. So oh, here's a case study in the South Carolina Department of Revenue. Now, this here's another fun fact. Just like any other military-type activity, you never know the truth about breaches because People can't admit the whole truth. They, um, but some version of the story becomes public, and you should be aware that all public disclosure of large breaches is essentially an act of fiction, um, where they have removed the details that would cause other legal trouble. So this is the public version of the. So the South Carolina Department of Revenue got hacked. <coughs> the most common way people get in is what happened here. They sent phishing emails to the staff and tricked somebody into clicking on a link or downloading a file. And then they wandered through the network. Yeah. Yeah. Will the GDPR have any impact here? The GD. Oh, you mean the Are Russians? Data protect, protection regulate, regulate. I don't know about it. The European? Oh, oh. yeah. The guy, uh, March uh, 2018. They're coming up with the. I think mostly European companies, but if data comes over through here. Yeah. Is it a regulation? Because okay. well, I mean, we have a lot of teeth too. Well, I mean, well, we have regulations here and uh, internet security rules, but they're totally not observed. There are uh, government standards for security, and they pass them, and every year they do an audit, and 95% of our U.S. government systems are out of compliance. So 
it's easy to make rules. It's very hard to actually improve security of the company. They have fines of 4% of annual revenue. Yeah, I've heard about that. They have, so there's fines and such, and so it, there may be some organization in the future, but right now, there's very little. Um, there are goals, but um, compliance is so far behind. We're nowhere near. So anyway, the, the interesting thing here is the amount of time it took. They sent the phishing mail on August 13. Somebody clicked on it. So two weeks later, on August 27, they got that person's Citrix credentials so they could remote control a device. Then they got, stole a password and got into the domain. Then they had logins and recon activities, because what they're doing is crawling through the network. When you first get in, you typically have a peripheral low-value asset, like the web server or somebody's desktop, who is not even an administrator. And then you have to infect that machine and try to take over what you can reach from there, and then infect that machine and try to take over what you can reach from there. It takes many hops pivoting through a network to get to anything really worthwhile. Um, and so it took them till September, which might be three, four weeks now, before they actually got into the domain controller. And they're still doing more recon on the 11th. It was the 12th of September, a whole month after they got in, before they actually found something important. They found a server full of something that mattered, like medical records or social security numbers or something. And they started copying it. Then they had trouble getting it out. But they finally managed to send the files out September 13 or 14. Then they continued more. Now, like most companies, they did not detect the intrusion at all. Most companies never detect that they've been hacked at all. What happens is the FBI calls you and said, somebody else got hacked that actually detected it. And when we found the bad guys and took their server down, we found your stuff on the server. So we're telling you, you got hacked. That is usually how they find out, because they have no network visibility at all. Nobody on their staff is capable of detecting it. And so law, October 10, law enforcement told them they'd been hacked, so then they called Mandiant, which is what you do. Mandiant exists largely because of the Chinese hack. They are the company that developed first how to respond to these things. They wrote the books. They did the training. They defined all the standards. And they wrote this book, and also managed the response book. They are the leaders in this field. So they're the people from who to learn how to do this. So uh, they performed remediation on October 20th. They figured out how to kick the bad guys out, and they kicked them out, and they're really out. And that's what Mandiant does. They charge a lot of money, but they will fly in a team of people. They will work for a week or two. They will really figure out what happened, and they will really kick them out. So that's why you're willing to pay them a pile of money, because your poor IT staff does not know how to do that. It's hard. All right. So that's the lesson. This attack succeeded, but the target had four weeks to stop it. If they had any detection capability, they, if they could have detected this attack in those four weeks, they could have stopped them before they got the crown jewels. And that would have saved them $12 million, which was the cost of all the consequences of this attack, which is pretty common because you have a lot of work in IT. You have to pay Mandiant to come in. You have to pay, send your customers all free credit monitoring. You have to pay regulatory fines. Then you have lawsuits. And, you know, there's a monstrous pile of suffering that comes after you get hacked, typically. Here's the median time. It's usually uh, nine months, eight months, eight months before anybody knows they've been hacked. Uh, um, I think now it's down to like 30 days. Uh, not on the average, I think. Uh, maybe just for the like Fortune 500. Company. Yeah, probably the big companies. The big companies are actually making teams and catching on. Yeah, yeah this is some kind of average or Mandiant from a couple of years ago. Your book is from, I think, 2013, so this is not the most modern. But that's why I'm teaching this class and everything. This is now recognized as something everybody has to learn. You have to hire people that can do this, because this is not good enough, 240 days. By then, the data has been stolen, and they printed new credit cards, and they've stolen the money of your customers. And you come in three months later trying to apologize. It's really not going to fly. So only one third of the companies detected it themselves. The rest get told by some outside agency long after the fact, way too late to do anything about it. So can, there's another thing that's been going on for a while called continuous monitoring, and that is not network security monitoring. Continuous monitoring is an older idea. This is compliance monitoring, where you just run a scan to see if you have known vulnerabilities, if your patches are on, and things like that. This is a fine thing to do, but this is still prevention. This is the old school. So it's an important thing. To, the original plan was certification and accreditation. You would test a product. You would then certify that this product meets the government requirements. You would then decide to use it. That's accreditation. You would use it only trusted products like Norton Antivirus or something and call that good enough. Well, that totally failed. So people decide we have to move, improve that, move up to continuous monitoring. So we're knowing if somebody has 
removed the antivirus or brought in extra computers that don't have it on there, have some kind of continuous monitoring to know if machines are actually meeting our security standards. That's compliance, and that's good, but that's not network security monitoring. Network security monitoring is a later layer of defense for after all this junk fails. So that's the game. CM tries to find your vulnerabilities and patch them. NSM is not trying to patch vulnerabilities. It's trying to detect intruders that are already in. So it only takes effect after all your defenses have failed. All right. And here's the other defenses you got out there. There's quite a few of them. You have firewalls, intrusion protections, antivirus. You have whitelisting, which is limiting what applications will run. So people cannot download some weird file and run it. You only allow known good files to run. Just our official chat client, our official office product. and sub If you want to bring in something from home, it won't run. It has to be on the approved list. That's a big step forward. Digital rights management limits who's allowed to copy things so you don't have unauthorized copies of proprietary property. And data loss prevention monitors the data leaving your company to see if somebody is taking things off premises that they shouldn't be. That is how Google caught China. Google was, China hacked 30 major American companies. Everybody you've heard of, Adobe, Microsoft, Cisco, and stole their stuff and nobody noticed. But when they hacked Google, Google saw their data leaving. They said, why is our data going to China? What's going on here? They're the only company that noticed it because they had data loss prevention that worked. Anyway, all these things are prevention. They do some kind of blocking, filtering, or denying. They detect something bad and block it. So they're prevention methods. Here's the picture of the firewall is your first one. If the firewall blocks it, the packets never get any further, and that solves the problem completely. The problem is the firewall can only look at packets typically one by one or a small stream, and it can only do a fairly cursory examination of them. So the firewall stops a lot of attacks, but those are the lame attacks. Things that get through then hit your intrusion prevention system, which does a much more thorough screening, looking for known bad stuff. Then they get in. Your antivirus will, if they actually make it on the file and try to run it, your antivirus or whitelisting will affect it running. Then if they get on and try to steal stuff, your data loss prevention might stop them from sending credit card numbers or social security numbers out. And then if they do, um, send it out. You've got digital rights management. So even if they steal stuff, they might discover that they can't open it because only the authorized user can open it. This is a cool thing Microsoft has. In the latest version of Microsoft Server, 2012 R2 and I think 2016, you can um, use Microsoft's cloud service, not Dropbox, but OneDrive, which is now I think called something else. And if you you can mark something company property, and everything is encrypted with a password that comes from your Active Directory login. So that if somebody takes it home on a thumb drive and puts it on their iPad and stick, or in their Gmail and has it at home, once they're no longer employed by the company, it won't open. They have the file, but they can't get the key anymore. So if an attacker was to steal it, they wouldn't be able to open it because of digital rights management. So it's a nice layer of defense. But all that is not what we're talking about here. Network security monitoring is here to detect and cope with the situation when all that stuff fails, because that really happens when you have a serious attacker like a nation state or a big organized crime syndicate. All that other stuff will top, stop your garden variety hacker. But there are really other groups out there that are much more serious. So. Those are controls that stop attacks, and they'll stop hit and run attacks, where somebody's just trying to do something and steal something and leave, but they're not going to stop these so-called advanced persistent threats, where people are planning not just to steal something and run, they're planning to put agents on your system that will live there forever, years, and continue stealing your stuff on into the future quietly so you'll never notice it. That's what China did, and they did it very effectively and basically stole stuff from American companies for more than 10 years now with almost no nobody that can stop them. And ever since 2010, when Google revealed it, everybody's been scrambling to have defenses to stop it. And that's where we're getting. Now, any large corporation was not willing to accept that adversaries like China can just steal whatever they want. They are willing to pay what it costs to hire a team that can really stop that stuff. And this is how you do it. So you pick a location on your network. You configure a switch to send copies of all the traffic to your monitoring system and put a server there that can uh, collect those packets and store them and analyze them. So here's a simple way to do it. 
you've got uh, your internal network, you've got the internet up here, you have your DMZ here with your public things like an email server and a web server that everybody's expected to see, and therefore these things are not very trusted because they're very likely to get infected and hacked because people can get directly at them. And you've got your wireless network, which you put on a subnet too, because anything wireless is also at risk because you don't even really control who can access it. Some guy could be in the parking lot connecting to your network doing unforbidden things. But your internal network down here is where you put the important stuff like credit card numbers and passwords and company proprietary secrets. And you, so you make a copy of all the uh, data that's coming through network segments and send it to your monitoring server. And exactly where you want to put it depends on your network structure. Um, one thing to be aware of is if you're never going to get all the data, then you have to carefully choose where you're going to monitor. Um, a tap is the best way to do it. A switch can have a span port, a managed switch, and that's one way, but it's better to have a special piece of hardware just for this purpose, which is a tap that can just run faster and catch all the data. So these things on top are taps. Those are switches. Buying a special box is better. A switch can do it up to a certain amount, but taps can handle more traffic. If you overload your monitoring system, it will start dropping packets. And when you investigate the data, you won't have all the data. And that's, of course, not as good. So there's a lot of cases where you can't really use network security monitoring. Uh, wireless traffic is usually encrypted with something like WPA or WPA2, and you, it's difficult to uh, every person has their own key, so you can't scan it very well. Uh, and especially traffic between two wireless devices typically does not pass through the company infrastructure at all, so you can't monitor it. Um, if you do go through the wired land, like at City College, if you have a laptop there, you connect to wireless, then it goes to the City College wired network and off to the internet, and so the City College monitoring system has a possibility of seeing it. Now, I don't know if we have monitoring, but I do know we have layer seven firewalls, and I think we also have archiving of the packets. So we do have some degree of monitoring here. And so if you had two machines and you sent a file from one machine to the other with wireless, our monitoring system would not see that. But if you sent it to the internet, then we would see that. All right, and cellular traffic, if you go through G, uh, 4G or 5G, that's not passing through our infrastructure at all. We don't have any chance to monitor it, and that's typically true at companies also. So it is a problem. There's a significant amount of traffic out there that you cannot monitor. Yeah? You know, remember a long time ago, the AT&T cipher <coughs> or sw monitoring switch? Uh, how, what message? That was about 10, 12 years. That was, yeah, that was the original uh, thing that eventually led to the Snowden leaks. That was a guy in San Francisco at 2500 California Street. They took a fiber optic tap on the backbone. So it was essentially this, just, that's a good thing you brought up. That was before Snowden. And all they did was there was a fiber optic switch down here at AT&T carrying all the traffic from San Francisco to the internet. And they put in a fiber optic tap like this that collected some of the signal and sent it to a monitoring device. So they saw everything that was leaving San Francisco to go to another city. So they wouldn't see things inside. I'm get, that's my understanding, not that we really know. They wouldn't see anything within a company or between two companies in town, but they'd see things that go out of town. And that's the point. Wherever you put your tap, you're only going to get a certain amount of traffic. There's traffic that doesn't pass through your tap, and you don't see that. So that's a thing to know. It'll, yeah. So some company in corporate identity management now has its own server, but how does that incorporate with a uh, intrusion detection? Like corporate identity management is what he's asking about, and I don't really know how that works. Oh, you mean? Single, single sign-on, and then... Oh, single sign-on. Single sign-on. Federated then, identity management. Right. Right. That's security. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, this is what happened to BART. The problem is, here's another problem. Not all of your company data is on your company servers. You have business partners. Like this, Microsoft, like everybody else, hires ADP to print their checks. Everybody does this for some reason. It turns out to be economical. ADP in Texas prints their checks and does the payroll and does the taxes, and Microsoft outsources it, so they don't even have access to that data. And in fact, what Microsoft did was install a federated identity management server at ADP so that people could use their existing Microsoft domain accounts to log in there to get their W-2. But that means if ADP gets hacked and somebody steals that stuff, all of Microsoft's defenses are useless, and yet you're still legally liable. If they steal your employees' W-2s, you're on the hook for it because it's just as bad if you don't protect it 
or if you hand it to some idiot who doesn't protect it. It's still your fault. You can outsource work, but you cannot outsource responsibility. This happened to Kaiser. Kaiser yeah. wanted um, medical records typed in, and they got tired of paying people to type them in, so they outsourced it to some company that said, we'll type them in for cheap. And then the company didn't tell Kaiser that they shipped it to Pakistan, where they got people to type it in for a dollar a day, and then they didn't even pay them their dollar a day. So somebody in Pakistan sent an email to Kaiser, and they say, I want my dollar a day, and if you don't give it to me, I'm going to dump your data on the internet. And they're like, who are you? And then they said, well, I'll prove it. Here's a bunch of your company data. They said, hey, this is real medical data. What is our data doing in Pakistan? Who is this person? How did this happen? And ultimately, Kaiser's still at fault for that. If you hand your data to somebody who does something awful with it, you're responsible. So be aware of that. Anyway, uh, so yeah, another issue is, of course, is it legal to monitor the network? People have privacy concerns, you know. Is it really OK? And you've got to check with your legal department. Uh, certainly, on a company machine in the wired network, it's pretty easy to say anything you do on the company machine is company property, and we're allowed to scan it. But people bring in their iPhone and their home computer, and then they take company servers home, and then they go on conventions, and pretty soon it's not really entirely clear exactly what's company data, so it's a big issue. There's a Wiretap Act which places some restrictions, and there are state laws that place restrictions, so in fact you do have to consider legal responsibilities. A few years ago, I did a project where I checked security problems at colleges. And I found a lot of security problems at colleges, and I told UC Berkeley. They had a, several insecure servers, and I contacted their security officer. He met me in a convention, talked to me, he said, yeah, no, I can't do anything around here. He said, I tried to scan the network, and I found a botnet. So I blocked it, then they called me, that was our research botnet, we're studying botnets, turn that back on. He's like, dude. Then I'm scanning the network, finding malware. They say, you can't do that, that's really our privacy. And they said, here's the rule. If you want to scan a server for any reason, you can't do it until you have written consent from every person, student, and faculty that might have used that server. Because otherwise, you're invading their privacy. And they're like, dude. So he said, when you tell me we got security problems, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and it's going to stay that way, too, because privacy is more important to us, because Berkeley is the king of free speech. And that might be true, but it's an issue. Um, certainly, you are invading privacy to some extent by monitoring the network. Uh, and that might get you in trouble. So one politically good move is your forensic professionals focus on internal threats when people are doing bad things on the company, and your incident response team focuses on external threats. Uh, this is really tough. A significant number of hacks do involve insiders. You bribe an insider to hand you the data, and then that's another way to circumvent all this because they have a legitimate login. They're okay to be on the network. Uh, nothing is ever perfect, and the systems we're describing here do not catch every possible threat. But they catch one real threat, which is large, powerful adversaries planning persistent backdoors on your networks. That's really happening, and people are really fed up with it, enough to pay what it costs to stop it. So you can make, here's a website to test your IDS. We'll use this a bit. You go here, and it just sends this string there. It's just a harmless web page, but it looks like uh, someone is running the ID command after getting a root shell. So your IDS system should pick that up as a suspicious bit of activity. So uh, you can send your apply for it, test my IDS. I got a typo there. You'll see a request for browser reply, and then you'll see other requests afterwards looking for fav icons. So I got a kahoot about this, but I think we'll take a break before we do it. It's about 10 minutes to 7. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll pick up at 7. Uh, there should be an attendance sheet somewhere. It's up here. Make sure you have your name on that so I know you're here. And you should sign one of these. Um, consent forms to be taped, and if anybody needs ad codes, come on up here and I'll give them to you. But we won't pick up until 7. So I think we're ready. Time to pick up here. Let's uh, go to the Kahoot. So hopefully you have a computer or a smartphone. If you don't, bring one next time. This is extra credit. If you can't do it, it doesn't uh, cost you anything. But it is fun. People like it, typically. So here is the first Kahoot, which covers just what we've covered so far in here. So this is a uh, just a contest. You'll get extra credit if you get the most right. What matters, you have to be correct, and you have to be quick at answering. I've been told that people in the live stream are pretty much hosed, because the City College live stream is 30 seconds behind, and I can't do anything about that. So my understanding is the live stream people are at a disadvantage. That's why this is extra credit, because it's not completely fair. But anyway, <laughs> it's the best I can do. And uh, good, the sound is there. That's good, because that makes it more fun. So. Uh, it should give you, there you are, so go to kahoot.it, 
and put in 903-189. This is just a way to keep people from falling asleep, really. Yeah, great. I gotta wait a little while for people to join anyway. All right. Put in, we only got 12, but I'm sure I got more than 12 people here, so that should be something like 30. So go to kahoot.it and you get extra credit if you are one of the top three here. I think we might have all the players that are coming. Okay. So, let's do it. Okay, six questions here. All right. What activity measures vulnerabilities on an ongoing basis? All right. It is not network security monitoring, it's continuous monitoring. Network security monitoring does not measure vulnerabilities. This is continuous monitoring, compliance monitoring, another word for it, just to see if you're up to your standards. So that's a fun fact. CM is already well established and people are doing it. NSM is the next step. All right. So what's the team that takes action when an intrusion is detected? Okay, it's the instant response team, the CIRT. Good, you got that one. Not your poor overworked IT people who <laughs> probably don't know how to do this and they have other things to do. All right, what's the process that finds intrusions? All right, that's your network security monitoring, a popular answer. Hmm. All right. How do you prevent all the intrusions? All right, good, you can't, that's a popular answer. That's why you need a team to deal with it when it happens. All right, what's the control that prevents sensitive data from being stolen? All right, that's data loss prevention. That's what Google had, so they knew when China was stealing their stuff. <coughs> okay, what control prevents unrecognized software from running? All right, and that's it, whitelisting. This is uh, one of the residues of racism in our language. White is considered good and black is considered bad. This is, there's a lot of terms like that. That's the legacy of our unfortunate past. But anyway, whitelisting is the list of good stuff you trust to run. And anything not on the list is forbidden. So here are the winners. I will make a note. Uh, Doug, Dougie, and A.E., and Archie. I actually know who he is. The others will have to tell me who they are later to find out to get their points. So there's a bit more to do in this chapter. All right, so uh, there's a lot of different data you can collect, a lot of different levels of data. And we'll go through these. The simplest to understand and the most expensive to collect and use is, of course, full content. 
just store a complete copy of every packet that goes over the network. This will fill gigabytes of storage. But of course, then you have the whole story when you want to analyze it. So that's one option. Um, you can look at the headers of it to get just a summary of the data going by, and then you can go to the individual full packet data to get all the details. Wireshark is the tool we'll probably use most. Simplest tool there's the top part just shows you headers. Source and destination, the protocol, and a simple summary in just a few words. Query, request, query, response, syn, synac, ac, and so on. This is headers. Those are not full packets, it's just a simple description of basically what each packet did, so you can quickly skim through it to decide if something merits further inspection. TCP dump is the command line tool that does the same thing. It gives you a very similar output as the header of Wireshark. One thing that is very strange about it is ACK appears as dot. So the TCP handshake, let me blow this up. Getting kind of blurry, but you can see it there. The TCP handshake is S S dot dot instead of SSAA. I don't know why. That always gave me a headache when I got used to it. Anyway, um, but test TCP dump, which is the command line tool, you do not want to just turn on Wireshark and let it run for hours. It will crash. Wireshark will use up all the RAM on your machine and crash. TCP dump is what you have to use for long-term monitoring, and it even has options to dump it in files, and it even has options to dump it in a rotating series of files. So one of my servers has continuous monitoring on it, or I did for a while, where I would dump it in a file and only let it grow to like 100 megs, and then another one, and keep 100 such files. So I always had a total of 10 gigabytes of data, and the new data overwrites the old data, and you can do that with one line of TCP dump. That's what it's for. Wireshark is not for that. Wireshark is for analyzing a small PCAP. If you get more than about 100 megabytes of data in Wireshark, it starts slowing down. You know, Wireshark is for being pretty and easy to use. But for real monitoring, TCP dump is better. Wireshark gives you a summary at the top of every packet. Then it has a middle pane that shows you the layers, the OSI layers. Ethernet, IP, TCP, and HTTP. And then at the bottom, it has the raw hexadecimal data. Here you can just you can ask, just like user, any other hex editor, you have hexadecimal data here, which is bit by bit, and you have ASCII over here for the part that can be read. So Wireshark is very nice to learn about networking and analyze things in depth, but it's not good for handling vast amounts of data for those who use command line tools. And so TCP dump can also collect the entire packet with the minus capital X option. It will then give you the same thing as the bottom pane of Wireshark, the full hexadecimal here. It does not have any option I'm aware of that gives you the middle pane of Wireshark that breaks the protocols up by OSI layer. <coughs> On that, you do a TCP minus capital NX. The N means do not attempt to resolve names, like don't turn IP addresses into domain names, and don't turn ports into alphabetic things like HTTP, which is pretty annoying. And the capital X means include the full packet after the summary line. So you have a summary line, and here's the whole packet in hexadecimal. So I do have all the data for later analysis. What does the N mean again? N means don't resolve names. So don't try to turn IP addresses into domain names, which slows it down and really makes it harder to read. I'd rather just see numbers. See, Wireshark also has the ability to follow a stream, and you'll be doing this in a project, so you can throw away all the addresses and combine all the packets for one conversation and show me just the layer 7. So here's an HTTP GET asking for a web page, and here's the response. So you get the whole story here. The stuff I send is red. The response is blue. This is very nice if you just want the layer 7 stuff. Like somebody sent an email. I want to see the email. I don't want to see a bunch of IP addresses and protocol flags and stuff. Get rid of all that and just show me the human readable part of it. That's often what you want. So in Wirecark, you can save things as a PCAP. By default, Wirecark will try to save it as PCAP NG, which is their new enhanced format. You should never use that. That gives you fancy features, which are fine if you only want to use Wireshark. But if you want to use any other tools, use old-fashioned PCAP, TCB dump PCAP, um, because then you can load it in other tools and analyze it. And for what we're doing, you definitely want to use the older format because there are a lot of other tools we're going to be using. Um, Wireshark tried to improve the format by making their own, and it did not catch on. It's sort of like Python 3. Python 3 might be great, but nobody uses it. So 
We're still using Python 2 if you actually want to interoperate with other people's stuff. Isn't it Python 2 going to be depreciated in like a year or so? I hope not, because all the libraries I need are still only in 2. I think it's like HTML, 1.1. They, They've been trying to deprecate it for 20 years, but there's a billion web pages in HTML 1 and 2. You can't deprecate it. And the same thing's true of all that Python. There's all these libraries in Python 2 that have not been ported to Python 3, so it's not going anywhere. There's, well, here's a fun fact. You know when you open up Linux, you type in ifconfig? Yeah. ifconfig has been deprecated for seven years. You're not supposed to be using it. Really? You're supposed to be using IP. Now, if you go on the map, it doesn't even have IP. So the people that decide to deprecate it have got their opinion, and they can just take a hike. The rest of us are going to keep using the old tool <laughs> for another 20 years. It's just like the administrators at the college trying to tell me what to do. I say, yeah, yeah, wander away, and I'll do what I want down here. <laughs> anyway, um, so anyway, um, you can connect to Explico. Let me show you Explico. So you're going to set up Security Onion. Uh, it's just a virtual machine. You install it like any other. And that's what the first project is. So let me point out, your, you've got projects that are due in a few weeks. Oh, I better not use that. Let's use another tab. All right. So if I go here to your CNET 50, there's a bunch of hands-on projects you can start doing now because I think that's the real meat of the course, is really doing it. Knowing what's going on from the textbook is kind of nice, but really doing it is what I think you want. So um, your first project is setting up Security Onion, and you can set up Elk down here on Ubuntu if you like, and your second project is using Wireshark to analyze some cases from CCDC. CCDC, the contest that we're doing here and other colleges do, where you compete with other schools to protect a network, one of them actually archives the PCAPs and puts them on the web. So those are CCDC real PCAPs we're using, which I thought was pretty cool. So you'll set up VMware. If you're using something else like VirtualBox, that's fine. But I only wrote instructions for VMware. You download the security Onion ISO. It's one gigabyte. And then you just boot a virtual machine from it and install it. Uh, you have to give it at least three gigabytes of RAM. Um, and then you just go through a typical installer with the usual nonsense about what language you're in and all that jazz. Um, and then when you're done, you'll have Security Onion. So I've got one I installed here, and I'll boot it up. And you can see the joy of Security Onion. Security Onion is just a Linux distribution with a whole bunch of tools installed that are good for network security monitoring and analysis. You could just start with like Ubuntu and install similar tools and have the same thing. And there's even a procedure on the wiki and such how to do that. Um, and that's more or less what the Elk stack is, is a similar version of that, where you start with just an ordinary Linux install and you install the tools you want. But this is just a handy way to get all the goodies in one package. One thing that is not nice, as you may know, is Linux browsers aren't as fun as real browsers on like Windows or the Mac. They don't have the plugins, they're not as pretty on the screen. So what I prefer to do, which is a less secure solution, is to open the firewall on Security Onion and access it from my real machine. Which you can do, and you can even have restricted IP addresses and such. But anyway, is this going to boot up or what? I'm a little nervous here. Yeah, you have to wake it up. Oh, that's right. It probably, how, do I, how do you wake it up? Yeah. Uh, it's not only going to sleep, it's actually still shutting down. I think I need to power it off. I tried to power it off, and it is rude enough that it doesn't actually power off very nicely. Yeah. Let's restart. Um, you have to, like, force the power off. The, it doesn't accept the uh, shutdown signal correctly. So this is the Security Onion front page. Like all versions of Linux, it has a couple things here, like memory test, but the default is what you want. And it will choose the default after a few seconds and boot up. Um, this is based on Ubuntu 14.04. The older version was 12.04, and people were complaining that's too out of date, which it is. So they updated to 14.04. I suppose there'll be a 16.04 version coming out sometime. When you install it, you have to choose name and password. I just used SO because I don't care about security for what we're doing here. I'm not going to be analyzing real data. By the way, there's problems with it. System problem detected. This is probably bugs in Linux. Um, you get used to this on Linux. This is why people who pay for things, like Splunk, don't have to put up with this nonsense. But if you use Linux, everything is always pretty buggy. 
you get used to this. Boy, I was glad I knew about this when I jailbroke my first iPad. Holy <laughs> cow. You jailbreak an iPad, it turns black for 60 seconds. Then it comes in with screaming error messages upside down in green. Then it goes black again. And then it came in my mind, hey, I paid a thousand bucks for this thing. What's, what am I doing to it? But that's the way Linux is. Screaming pages of error messages. And you just ignore that and keep going. So here's various tools. Once you get it installed, you have things like Explico and Squirt and Elsa. Mm -hmm. Notice how a minute or so after I start it, it then tells me it wants to monitor network traffic. What's happening is it's starting a whole bunch of processes to scan the network. So you have to start it and then wait a few minutes for it to really get going. And it doesn't give you like a window showing a progress bar or anything. That's what you get when you get a free product. So it's not really listening yet. But after a minute or two, it will be listening. And then I can connect from outside here so I can get a better picture. So this is my IP address. And Explico runs on port 9876, which is just somebody's choice. And there it is. This is the joy of Explico. This is what people usually do in Linux. They can't be bothered to actually draw a graphic user environment, so they connect it to a web server and have a web page. So you have to log in. The username and password are both Explico by default. And I did not change them because I don't care. So you log in. Now you can create cases. Um, let me see. I've shared in my slides the steps for this demo so I get it hopefully right. All right, you can make a PCAP. So let's make a PCAP. That's another thing I should demonstrate in Wireshark. So on my host system, when I attempted to do this inside Security Onion, it didn't seem to make a good PCAP. I think my Security Onion doesn't have enough power to really catch all the packets very efficiently. So I'm going to start sniffing here. OK, there's traffic going by. Now I'm going to surf a couple of websites. I now I want to go to unencrypted websites so we can see things. So let's go to um, my unencrypted page, ad.shamsclass.info. That's a server that's uh, plain text. OK, go to some tutorial there. Then let's go to the one he did, www.testmyids. That just has this string, which makes it look like somebody's hacked your server. And then here's another one, Kitten War, <laughs> which is also not encrypted. So Kitten War, you get to choose which kitten is cuter. This was Am I Hot or Not for kittens. So you can play Kitten War for a while. OK, so now I've done that. Now we've got some network traffic to examine. So here's Wireshark. I'm going to stop capturing. Wireshark has captured 3,700 packets, so that's not very big. And now I can save it. As I mentioned, Wireshark by default will try to save it as a PCAP NG, and you don't want to do that because nothing can open that except Wireshark, as far as I know. You want to save it as TCP dump. PCAP, which is a really old format. It's the standard. Every tool can open that. So I'm going to save it as demo, call it demo4.pcap. Because it's an open source tool, it doesn't fill in the extension for you the way a Windows tool would, just to annoy you. Um, that puts it on my desktop. So now, let's put it in Explico. So here's glorious Explico. I make a new case. And then I say, I'm going to upload a PCAP. So I give it a case name, which I don't care about. And now I have to give it a session. I don't know why. And now I have a session. And now I can upload a file. So I choose my file, which is desktop uh, demo4.pcap. And then I upload, so it's going from my Mac into the virtual machine over the network. And I think by HTTP and not HTTPS, but I'm not sure about that. Might be HTTPS. <coughs> it takes a while to decode. This is why they tell you you need a lot of resources. And if you have three gigs, it'll be kind of slow, which is what I gave my virtual machine here. That's the minimum. Security Onion will complain if you don't give it at least three gigs of RAM. And they say, if you really want to monitor stuff, more is better. Um, <coughs> OK, it's up there. So it has now analyzed my data. And it's done a pretty good job. See, down here, for example, is HTTP. There are no posts, but there are 52 gets, which is correct. I viewed several pages, but I didn't log in or anything. There's no video, but there's 20 images. Here's no emails. 
Um, let me shrink this so we can see it. You can see how it's not really fitting on the screen, and that's what you get when you have a free tool. Um, 19 text flows and so on. So I can go to web, for example. And I can go to site, and it will show me all the URLs. So various Kittenmore pages, test by IDS, various Sam's class pages. If I want to reconstruct one of those pages from the packets, I just click on it here. And that will reconstruct the page from the packets so you can see it, which is kind of nice. However, be aware that it's only loading one file. Now, this page is just one line of text, so it works. But if I try to reconstruct one of those Kittenmore pages, it's just going to give me the page with no images and no cascading style sheets, so you don't really get very much of it. Because a real web page is like 20 or 30 things, and you're working from one request here. So you can view the pages, sort of, but it's not really the same thing that the user saw. But you can also see the images. There's all the images. It'll pick them right out so you can look at them and page through them. And this is like other forensic tools will do the same thing. And notice it even picked up the images from some homework I went to. So all the images that went by. Now, if it was HTTPS, which most of the web is now, none of this would work. Of course, it would all be encrypted, and you don't have the key. So you would just see something like a record of a connection to port 443 without anything higher being visible. So as the web switches to more and more HTTPS, the power of this kind of tool goes down. That's a thing to know, and that's why most companies do not let people use HTTPS out of the company. They man-in-the-middle attack it and have a custom certificate, which they put in the browsers, or they bribe someone to give them a uh, semi-forbidden copy of a real root certificate from a friendly uh, trusted certificate authority so they can man-in-the-middle secretly, which is what the police do and the FBI and the government of China, and probably the NSA, and all the large corporations. Um, so that's the game. Uh, there's the game. You upload it. You can see the pages. You can see that. All right. So there, that's full packet data. If you have all the packets, you can do that stuff. See the images, rebuild the web pages, and everything. That's, of course, nice. But you might not want all that. You can have extracted content data, like that one page where I saw just the images, or just the files. That's another thing you can do. Um, and you can load, do things like follow the packet um, session to see just the layer 7 data without all the addresses. A lot of tools can do that. As you see, Explico can do it. Wireshark can do it. Network Miner can do it. There's a bunch of tools that can pick objects out of it. Now, there's session data. This is what Bro creates, among other things. Bro is a very powerful intrusion detection system, and it's included in Security Onion. And I'm very pleased to teach you a little bit of Bro. Bro is considered very hard to use, but very powerful. And now we're beginning to have some instructions, so I think we'll cover it a little bit in this class, although not in much depth. But anyway, Bro can create session data logs, and here's what it looks like. It shows type, time, address, port. It shows you what machine talked to what other machine and for how long. This is the network analogy of what they call, um, in telephone monitoring, I forget the name. This is what the information that goes on your phone bill. Who did you call, at what time, and for how long, but you don't see the contents of the call. Um, pen registers is what they call it. And that's what you have here. That's also what the Cisco product NetFlow produces. You get a line showing who connected to what and how many bytes they moved. So you can see if people are downloading stuff, but you don't see what they downloaded. You just see who's doing what and how much. So you can do something like throttle bandwidth to match your customers what they paid for, things like that. But you're not actually looking at what they did in any detail. You're just looking at how much they did. All right, so it's much smaller than full content data, and therefore it's much easier to store and much easier to search through. Um, but you cannot reconstruct full files and web pages from session data. All you have is, is the envelope information. Then there's transaction data, which you can also get from Bro. This is like session data, but it focuses on requests and reply pairs. So things like HTTP, it shows you the request method of get, go up here, and there's the user agent. There was one request and one reply, and they call that a transaction. Pretty much the same as sessions, slightly different, but not in any main, big way. Then there's statistical data, where you have a summary of it. For example, you can summarize the entire file. Wireshark has this. If I go to my file that I just saved here in Wireshark, you can go um, statistics, capture file properties. 
And here I see how big a file is exactly when it started and when it ended, how many packets, and so on. General overall statistical information, which is, of course, also useful. But again, you're not going to be able to reconstruct web pages or anything from that. You're just going to have uh, global pictures, you see packet links. There's also other ones worth looking at. Protocol hierarchy and packet links are fun. Statistics, protocol hierarchy. I was real pleased when I saw this one. This one shows you what's been happening on a network in a really high level way. So I've got Ethernet, and I probably have nothing but Ethernet, which is reasonable. That Ethernet wiped out all its competitors like Token Ring and stuff. Then I have IP version 4, and there's nothing using IP version 6 here. So it's IP version 4. In there, I got UDP and TCP. In UDP, I got all these different network protocols. DNS is probably the main one. Looks like my Dropbox tried to move something over, over uh, UDP and so on. Um, and here I got TCP secure sockets layer, HTTP. And then inside there, I got the image, ping images and so on. So it tells me you know, how many packets and how many bytes of each of those types I've got which is a useful kind of summary, but will help you zero in on what you care about. Um, all right. And the last one was packet lengths. Let's try that one. OK, this just shows you how big the packets are. So I got 3,700 packets. And most of them are from 40 to 79 bytes, which means they really didn't send much. These are things like ARP requests and DNS requests that don't carry any data. They just ask somebody to tell me your address. But down here, where I have hundreds or thousands of bytes, these are the images and web pages and such coming down. And you can see how many there are. Another way to get some clues about what part of it might be interesting to you. So if I'm worried that somebody downloaded malware, I'd ignore all the small packets. All I care about is the things that are big enough to contain a program. All right. And you'll do it in the projects. Wireshark can also extract all the files that are in the packet very easily. All the things that were moved by FTP or HTTP, of course, it cannot get into the encrypted transmissions unless you have the keys. And you can feed the keys into Wireshark, but the keys are not easy to get in most cases. So there's the pictures of that stuff you saw. All right, and then there's metadata. Metadata means data about data. So after you look at the packet stream or the session data or log data and you find something interesting, like an IP address, you might want to know more about it. So you go use some other tool like Whois or RobText to learn about an IP address. I've done this a lot. Some, something appears and it says this IP address seems to be doing something bad. So you Google the IP address. That's my first step. And you find out if it's on other hate lists of things that are known to be bad. Um, let's try who is, test my DNS. Who is is a service that comes from your internet service provider. Let me get out of Python here. All right, and let's make this big and move it down here. All right, so I can do who is, uh, test my IDS.com. And the City College who is server will let me do it, and there you go. I get information about who owns this. Somebody called Mesh Digital in the UK registered it. And here I got email and phone number, but that stuff has been redacted by the provider. It's, host, it's registered at oneandone.com, though, which is a well-known name registrar. So I have some information about it. So if these guys were attacking me, I could now contact these companies and say, your customer is attacking me, kick those bums off and things like that. And I have some idea what nation it's registered and so on, so I'd have some clue whether the laws there are any use and it would do me any good to like prosecute somebody there or whether it's some nation where there's no hope of getting any good out of a prosecution. Then there's, um, this is Rob Tex, and I saved this as a link to demonstrate it here. By the way, you'll see references to chapter links. They're down here at the bottom, chapter 1A and 1B and so on. Here's my Rob Tex link. Link 1C will show me what Robtex has to tell us about that. And I think I'm just going to do go. And it's still loading. It is still loading. That's the problem. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's why it's not showing. Because Robtex is actually very nice. It has a whole bunch of uh, different 
panels, all these panels that show you more and more information. I'll give this 10 seconds, and then I'll just look at my saved picture. That's why I have them, in case I, OK. Looks like Robtex has some kind of problem. I'll give it one more try. Perhaps City College blocks it or something stupid like that. No, it wouldn't have loaded at all in that case. Let's see if I got a good picture in my slides. All right. So here, I can see the email servers are one and one servers. Here's the address of them. Those are the name servers. Here's a mail server. And it has many other things down here, too. One thing I thought was cute is it has a nice graph of autonomous systems. Uh, this is Border Gateway Protocol, the one I was talking about earlier that is so insecure. Every company gets an autonomous system number, and traffic is routed to the AS number. So if you are Sprint, you have a million servers but one AS number, and the internet will just deliver stuff to the nearest Sprint server and then say the job is done. Your problem now. Just like we have thousand workers here in classrooms everywhere, the US Post Office will just bring up a truck and dump a pile of mail and say, OK, you deal with it. Your internal sorting is your problem. As long as I got it somewhere in your company, I'm good. And so this AS is probably a company with hundreds of thousands of servers, but it's just one object on Border Gateway Protocol, because as far as they're concerned, once I hit the right company, it's not my problem anymore. Their internal routing has to handle it. And this will show you how the systems are connected to other systems. And when something bad happens, like um, Google killing Japan, you'll see these unexpected connections appear here, and the experts can track down that sort of thing with this kind of information. Uh, the next kind of data in the type is alert data. This is when you have an automatic system, like an intrusion protection prevention system, that has a list of known bad things, and it detects them and then puts a log in, like snort. So this is known bad things alerts um, that are stored somewhere in a log file. And sometimes they lead to instant messages or telephone calls to the administrator, depending on how you configured it. Um, one of my students was uh, administrator at Cloudflare, still is. And they take turns there being on call for like a week. So what happens is when, they, when the, their system detects an attack and it cannot resolve it automatically, it calls the administrator. It calls your phone number, it calls your cell phone, and if you don't answer in 15 minutes, it calls the other administrators. So if you're on call, you have to answer that phone or they will say rotten things to you when you come into work the next day and they said, I got woken up at 2 a.m. and it wasn't my week to be woke up at 2 a.m. So I was actually sharing a hotel room with him at DEF CON and the call came in at 2 a.m. and he sat up in bed, pulled out his machine and started tapping all these Linux commands and was, you know, it was pretty funny. He he hit a bug in Ubuntu and changed some permissions on a file, and then he was sending a message, guys, I'm changing it back, don't freak out. You know, That's the way it is. And those are what alerts tend to be. Um, so here's some alerts. Uh, here is SGUIL detecting alerts. So here it is detecting Pandora usage. Some client is listening to music at work, which might violate your policies. Um, here is an SSH connection. A brute force tool, someone's making a lot of SSH login. Here's a SIP vicious login, which is a scanner that finds uh, IP telephones and shouldn't be used for any legitimate purpose. So whoever's running SIP vicious is probably an attacker. And on you go. Suspicious inbound to MySQL. That's probably something that looked like a SQL injection. Those are alerts. Your, your system had detected suspicious traffic and recorded it. So you get all this stuff. And the point is, you hopefully have enough information now that you can detect an attack and you can analyze it to find out what's happening. What did they get? That's the plan. Um, you're trying to get somehow boil the baffling amount of data down to actionable information you can understand and use. And then there's retrospective analysis, which is after you have detected an intrusion, then you have to say, how long have they been in here? And what did they already get? That's an important question, in addition to how do we kick them out? That's one of the big issues. How much damage have they already done? And so on you go. And also, are there other intruders that we didn't notice too in the past? So looking at your past data is part of the job. And then, of course, there's post-mortem analysis. After it's all over and you have kicked them out and you've restored things back to normal function, then you should analyze always your response and decide how to improve it next time. Now that we see this, we better upgrade systems, put in another firewall, change our policies, so this won't happen again. All right. There are drawbacks of network security monitoring. 
Uh, the most obvious one is there are a lot of situations where you cannot practically monitor. Like I said, VPNs, if people are using virtual private networks, you don't have the key, you can't see it. That's why if you want to be safe as an end user, as a customer, people often tell me, or I tell, especially I tell people, your Android phones are garbage. I hack Android apps all the time. They are ridiculous. It might as well be 1991. The people writing this stuff have no clue about security. They say, what can I do? I say, well, you can use a VPN. That would help a lot. Then it would add another layer of encryption on all your traffic that's under your control. So even if the clown that wrote the app doesn't know anything, you can put a layer on top. So VPNs make you a lot safer. They protect your network traffic, and they also mean your network monitoring system doesn't work. Yeah? Um, are you talking about phones like using, a, uh, like, I don't know, AT&T or the one? Yes. Either one. This is a very good question. Although, um, the question is, uh, are you referring to Wi-Fi or 4G and 5G? Uh, Wi-Fi is much more dangerous. 4G and 5G actually has another layer of encryption that was added by the phone company. Now, the really old phone services in some European countries are still using GSM, and some of those have no encryption. But Wi-Fi frequently has no encryption, so it, the, the need for a VPN would be much larger on Wi-Fi than on the 4G and 5G, but it would not hurt in either case. Then there's network address translation used at client and server sides, and of course that means that you don't really know who's coming in. This is often a problem. People will detect an attack, they'll block an IP address, and for example, every student at City College appears to be coming from the same IP address. We have one gateway, so if someone did an attack from campus, everybody on campus would be blocked, and that's probably not what you want to do, but the problem is network address translation means you really don't know who the source of anything is, um, and that's why the uh, the Recording Industry Association has trouble figuring out who to prosecute. Somebody is downloading an illegal copy of stuff, but because of network address translation, I really don't know who it is. Like somebody at the college is doing it, so they send letters to the college saying, somebody at your college is doing it, please hunt them down and stop it. That happened to me. Some students were doing it in one of the labs I was administering, um, and you know we coped. But in fact, nobody outside the college can really track down who's doing things on the college. But if the college doesn't make some sincere effort to find them and stop it, then we could be sued for the cost of the copyright infringement. Uh, your mobile device, as we say, your, your iPhone and iPad are typically using things like 4G networks, and those are not monitored. If you have a high traffic volume, your network security monitoring platform might not be able to keep up with the traffic. Um, and that means you won't have a good full PCAPs. And of course, like we say, you may have privacy concerns, so you are not willing to monitor everything or as thoroughly because you want to protect the privacy of your users. Um, so those are all considerations that limit the value of network security monitoring. All right, now we're down to the last bit, which is another Kahoot. So I should have, here I got one B, all right. And I suppose this is still set, yeah, like before, good. And this stuff is set to randomize the answers. Good. OK. I think it'll work. OK. 543-122. Somebody on the stream said it's better if I read that number out loud. So I'll wait for some people to join. All right. I'm going to go. 30 is the winner. OK. So what data allows you to recover images? And that's full content, of course. You need that. None of the rest of this has enough information to reconstruct the images. All right. Dennis got 1,000. That means he answered in half a second. That's how you get 1,000 points. But you do have like five seconds to hear the question before the timer starts. So what's the data that only includes recognized malicious acts? All right, and that's alert data. Good, that's a popular answer. Archeum is there at the top. That's good. Okay, you get a domain name and look it up on who is. What kind of data is that?
All right, that's metadata. Good, the most popular answer is correct. All right, so you view all the images from a PCAP file. What kind of data is that? We did that with Kitten War. Hey there. Okay, that's it, extracted content. All right, Art Jim's doing pretty well here. All right, well, I think you can go over a thousand because you get a streak, you get a bonus for getting. Anyway, what's the data in a log file? All right, now session data is the only one on that list that would be in a log file. There's a few kinds, but session data is one of them. And what's the most difficult thing to monitor? All right, and that's 4G, of course. Your company can't monitor it, only the phone company can monitor it, and it's probably not going to be easy for you to convince them to let you at it legally. So here's the winners, Derp, and RTM again, and JD. So, yeah, okay, so, so that's it. Um, if you want to work on campus, I'm going to clean up here and go to the, the hacking lab, which is Science 214, to help anybody who wants to work there. Nothing is due for several weeks, so you should be working on your projects. By the next class, take a couple of quizzes online and do the first project. Get Security Onion running. And if you won, come and tell me your name. You, are you a winner? What's your name? Josh. Josh. And that's JD, right? Okay, Josh.